Hey, how you guys doing? It's good to see you. And it's Friday. <laughs> and next week is Thanksgiving. So very nice. Um, so let me talk for a second, if I can go to the right place here. There we go. I've got a few things. So um, the um, we're going to talk about debugging. But first, I, was, I, I did want to mention, as you're working on your, um, on your project, a couple of people were asking about this, so I wanted to talk about this for a second. Um, so Bootstrap tutorial on W3 schools is really nice because not only does it tell you a lot of things you can do with Bootstrap, but you know, like you can go in there, like here's spinners, if you, here's a spinner, and for all of them, you can get the code and you can run it, right? And then you can play with it. Um, oh wait, you're not sharing screen in case you... Oh, okay. So let me, I thought I was, thank you. Okay. So let me go back here. So I made a thing here, bootstrap tutorial. And uh, let me just go in there again. 
Um, oh, sorry, I'm in edit mode, so it's acting weird. I need to not be in edit mode. <laughs> um, anyway, the bootstrap tutorial has lots of stuff in there, like um, list groups. And for all of these, you can go in and you can mess around with the code, like for example, and, and you can even prototype your code here. You know, fourth item. Run, all right? And so this is great. Now, one of the things that I wanted to show you because these are very useful, especially like when you're logging in or doing like a special search, is to do um, modals. Hadn't really talked about modals before, so let's talk about those for just a second, if I can find today's date. Um, a bootstrap modal, we can go in here, and the way a bootstrap modal works is it's pretty simple. So what you can do is you can define a modal. You say class is equal to modal. You give it an ID. You can give it whatever ID you want. And it just sits there. And then here, up here, we have a button outside the modal. And it has a data toggle modal to say it's going to turn a modal off and on. And then it has a data target my modal. So that's this button here. When you open this button up, you get a nice little modal. Now, a modal is like a mini web page. You can put anything you want into it. Like I could add inside of the modal, I can add some text, you know. This is text, you know, and um, I have to run it again. But, but before I do that, I can put in there an input box, input, um, I don't know, what is it, class equals text. Let's see if that's enough, I don't remember. Um, so we run it, and here we go, right? And so you can put buttons in it, you can put inputs in it, and, um, and so I'm kind of showing you modals, but I'm also showing you how you can, you can use W3 schools to try your stuff out before and, and to sort of tweak it and get it the way you want it to look. And you don't have to go through this longer process of writing your code, you know, and, 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 and testing it. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a little bit shorter try and see what you get model. Okay, the other thing is, you know, there's a whole, the bootstrap manual itself got all sorts of stuff in there you've probably already seen. And here's the modal one with lots of test modals. Um, and so I just wanted to show you modals and also show you how, the, how useful the bootstrap tutorial is for getting stuff done. And, and you can make things look really nice doing this. OK? So um, before we talk about debugging, does everybody want to show does each of the three groups? I can enable sharing. Um, who wants to show what they've got so far? Um, Hang on here, I got stop sharing with the wrong button. Um, about um, um, the team with, with Lucas, Josh, Ken, and Takashi. Show us what you got. Okay, um, I'll share screen then. Uh, the rest of the account, can I uh, screen, screen share, please? Oh, there, now you can, sorry. Um, no, you're not allowed to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is what we have. 
Um, once we run the server and when we, we run, we have this model that pops up. Um, we still haven't figured out the login, but we can register. So we can be like Kanazawa. Then, you know, any password like one, two, three, four, GH or something. And I'd be like, I'm. And sign up. And then. Uh, it was working like a few minutes ago. <laughs> Sorry, you don't need to laugh. Yeah. This, this is the okay. um, this is the the bane of demos, right? Mm -hmm. Well, here, uh, can you can you choose another group and then we'll tr quickly try to fix this? Because I think <laughs> okay, I think it, it was because um, we just changed like the new file. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. So Jimmy, you could uh, stop sharing. Yeah, Jimmy, Charlie, and group. Uh, Jimmy or Angie, can you share? Because it's not, uh, the node's not working on mine, my uh, terminal. Uh, yeah, I can try to get it going. Um, I can share. Oh, okay. Never mind. Uh, so... We have like the search, so can so far just kind of search like artwork, and then it'll show up as pictures. So we have so far. Nice. Um, it can you can search it by kind of any of the parameters. So like, but yeah, that's how this is working so far. Nice. Now, of course, some of the matches come up with a lot. Do you just put them all up there, or? Um, right now I do, but um, I originally had it limiting 20, but I just figured it might be easy to... Yeah, what would be nice, of course, is you could have <clears throat> like a like buttons on the, you know, show 20 at a time mm -hmm. and have a next and previous button at the bottom, right? Or something like that. Yeah, definitely. Because, um, you know, if you try to, if you try to display a thousand yeah, it takes a really long time. To crash somebody's browser and, the, and, yeah. and, and screw the internet. Because <laughs> these are all actually pretty nice size images. Now, if you click on an image, I'm just curious, does it uh, show no, the size done it. version? Try uh, it. We don't have that for this version, I don't think yet. Try it because to some extent, if, if you reference a, 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 an image and click on it, I think in some contexts, it, but it's not working when you doesn't do it. Uh, it doesn't look like it's working right now. Okay, I think you can do that fairly easily. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I, you just Google how to do it, yeah. Sounds good. So that's pretty nice. Awesome. Very good, I am very impressed. Okay, so let's see the third group what you've got going. I can share my screen. Um, uh, sorry, let me just navigate to it. Um, so we've got a new, we haven't, we do, it's not exactly pretty yet, but um, we've got a way to create new users that we're still trying to work out the SQL calls. So for now, um, when you click on the login button, you don't even have to put anything in. It just okay. takes you in. That's, that's totally reasonable, right? Still working on that. Yeah. Um, and then we've got a general search. So um, it you put in a term and um, it can be artist or um, title or location or anything else. So if I put in Dega, um, it shows us all of oh nice by Dega, an account of the number of pieces found. Um, and so if we want to go to, we'll say this one, it pulls up the page. Nice. Okay. Um, 
and yeah we again it's not pretty yet but it's, right. it's yeah. functional very nice this is a great start okay Team one, ready to give it give give it another shot. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, so we get a blue screen of death. So we just figured that we have to change the SQL and some other things so that we can include like special characters like apostrophe. Right. Um, in the bio section. So if I do, I am from Japan. Um, it works. And then. Um, you can. Are you showing your screen? Oh, right. Sorry. <laughs> hey, I've never made that error. <laughs> so, um, the server's running. We load it and then we can register. And then, a password. And, um, And then it's added. And then uh, you can search the usernames. Um, but yeah. Okay. Which, of course, you're not going to want that to work really for the. I mean, you yeah. might want to have a search of usernames, but you're mm -hmm. not going to want to have people able to edit and delete them, right? <laughs> yeah. We're at the very minimum <laughs> stage. Right, yeah. So, so you're working more on the user side, and the other teams have been working more on the search side, which is fine. I mean, those are just different approaches. Um, mm -hmm. You know, what I'm, what I'm happy to see is that you guys are putting in some work, and you're making progress. And I'm, I'm very excited. In fact, I think I've, I've verified that when you do your, um, your next set of demonstrations, we are going to have people from the um, the art gallery here because they're very interested and they may make some suggestions. Um, and so, you guys look a little nervous, but okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so now, so here's the thing. What we're gonna talk about today is something I have an unbelievable amount of experience in. It doesn't mean I'm the best in the world or anything, but, um, I've done a lot of it both and, you know, it's kind of interesting for me. Not only have I done a lot of debugging, I've done a lot of debugging of other people's codes, as you know. <laughs> um, and, you know, for me, debugging has become almost second nature in the sense that I, um, I have, you know, sort of refined my techniques and, um, you know, and I'm used to working in a situation where um, I may not have ever seen the code before. So let's talk a little bit about debugging. You know, what, what debugging is all about, of course, is it's about finding out what is causing a defect, right? Now, what we want is quality software, obviously. We want software that works. And we don't debug to improve software quality. We design and we do code reviews to improve software quality. Debugging is about um, finding the errors that are still in there and figuring out what's causing them, right? It's not enough just to know that there's an error in there. You have to find it. You have to diagnose it, right? Just like if you go to a doctor and, you know, you have a pain in your right eye, he doesn't just say, well, you're right. You have a pain in your right eye. The goal is to figure out why there's a pain in your right eye, right? So that you can then, then propose possible solutions. Um, so again, Qual software quality must be built from the start. The best way to build a quality product is to develop requirements carefully, design well, and use high quali quality code practices. You know, another more profane way of saying this is, is perhaps you can't polish a turd, 
right? You've probably heard that term before, right? If you write really crappy code and then say, okay, we'll debug it and make it better, you're not. You're just trying to, to, to fix up something that's just bad to the core. And so debugging doesn't, doesn't change that, right? In fact, your goal, your goal is just to do just such a good job of writing and designing and code reviews and careful reflective processes that debugging is going to be minimized. Um, now, it's interesting, um, the average debug time in minutes, faster programmers can debug faster than slower programmers, but, and they tend to find more of the errors. And <laughs> they tend to make cause less problems with the fixes they make. And this is something that, that you have to understand is one of the reasons you don't want to debug your code is because in a, in a vast, in a really high percentage of the cases, the fix inadvertently causes other problems. Because you're working with a complex system, you may not fully understand all the aspects of it. And then when you go to try to fix it, you, um, When you go to try to fix it, you 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 make other you, you don't understand the full domain, and you make changes that that, that breaks something else. Um, so now, one thing about defects is you can see them as opportunities, right? When you have a defect, you you, you it forces you to look at the code and figure out how it works. Um, it also allows you to learn about mistakes you made, and in my case. It allows me to <laughs> understand the kind of errors students make. In fact, if I've, if I've had the same project for a few years, or even if just in general, in the same coding domain, after a few years, a student can come in oftentimes and I'm like, yeah, I, I think I know what your error is before you even tell me, because I've, you know, I know what we're doing and I know what people are going to hit, right? And so you learn. <laughs> so I know a lot about, errors that, that, that students make. Um, you learn about the quality of code from someone who has to read it, right? If, if you write really bad code and then you go in and try to fix it, you're gonna be mad at yourself. You learn about how you solve problems, right? You think about, you can think about how, how do you solve a problem, right? Diagnosis is an interesting problem. It's this problem where you have bad, you know, impro, in, improper behavior of a system and how do you, and, and you might have thousands or tens of thousands of lines of code, how do you go about narrowing down where it's at and what's actually causing it? And, you know, of course, a lot of things can be red herrings because a lot of times you, you know, for example, <laughs> you know, I can't tell you the number of times a student has come in and said to me, well, I was working on my program and this number was always one more than I wanted it to be. And so I subtracted one from it, but now I have other errors, right? And it's like, yeah, do you, you need to know why it was one greater. You're just sort of trying to fix the surface aspect of the problem and you're not really digging in. So we also learn about how you fix, fix some debugging. <laughs> in Dante's hell, Satan has agreed to share the lowest circle with programmers who don't learn to debug, debug effectively. He tortures programmers by making them use some of the common but terrible debugging approaches, right? So debugging can be a sort of hell if you don't do it right and if you write bad code. And in fact, many times in the middle of the debug, I have to look at the code and say, I think it's time for a rewrite. Professor Scan? Yeah. 
It sounded like you were reading something there. Are you oh, trying? I thought I was, again, I did. Oh, okay. Right, yeah. I thought I was um, oh, okay. the Devil's Guide to Debugging. <laughs> right? So, okay. yes, thank you. Um, there we go. Now, how can you find an error? Well, one thing is you can just guess, right? You can scatter print statements randomly, try changing things in the program until something seems to work. Don't back up the original version of the program. Stock up on coal and candy bars because you're in for a long night at the terminal, right? This is the worst form of debugging, right? And this is what causes people to go crazy. And it's probably caused more than one student to decide, um, hang on, I'm sorry. I have to go get my dogs. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. So, you know, if you go about, pro <laughs> if you don't go about it right, it's the most frustrating thing in the world. And I've, I've felt that frustration before. Um, now, th these are sort of, I suppose, a little bit of satire. Another thing you can do to try to debug is say, I don't want to waste my time to trying to understand the problem. I just want to find out, an, I just want to find out something that's wrong and try to tweak it till it's right, okay? This never works. You have, to, you have to understand the underlying reason. You know, this is like if somebody came in and they said, and then the doctor said, oh, they have a fever, let's just put them in a tub of ice. And if we can get their temperature down, then everything's going to be okay, right? And that's, not the solution. It's a solution to the symptom, but it's not a solution to the problem. You have to understand the systems that are going, that, 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 you know, the internals of the system and, and what really happened. You're not just saying, well, let's just try to put a Band-Aid on it. Right, so here we go, X equals compute Y. If Y is equal to 17, X is equal to 25. So this is some fix somebody did because they noticed, well, when I was 17, I got the right, wrong answer. So I'll just sort of fix it, right? I'll fix it for that case. Horrible solution. Whose fault? Now, here's the thing. And I've been down this road many times. I can't, I can remember early in my days, um, I would sometimes think, I think it's right. There's something wrong with the computer. I can't tell you the number of times people have come in and said, there's something wrong you know, with REPL. There's something wrong with my compiler. I, if this code is right, but it's not working, right? You always have to assume that it's your problem, right? There's something wrong with the standard template library. Not likely, right? There's something wrong with this thing that I'm importing that's a well-known Python module. Uh, not likely. It's most, almost always your fault. Now, it's not always your fault, but it's almost always your fault. And you start with the assumption and you rule out that it's your fault before you start pointing your fingers elsewhere. Now, sometimes it's not. Like, I, I have an interesting story where one time I had written a, a network driver for Windows. And drivers are pretty complicated pieces of code. They run at the kernel level. And, you know, this, and it worked. But when I pushed it hard, when I pushed, you know, five, 10,000 packets a second through it, it would occasionally, like maybe once every 30 seconds, it would drop a packet. And it was like, you know, what? Because every time it dropped a packet, TCP has to reset. And it's just a mess. And so, and it was really slowed things down. And so I spent, and I kid you not, I spent six months looking for an error in my code. Finally, I got my hands on, on some of the Windows source code and I looked at Windows and it was, a, it was sort of a bug in Windows. What was happening was is 
Windows was assuming it was using a different wireless driver than my driver, and they assumed that, 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 that a four packet queue was enough. And so they had a four packet queue that just autom that didn't check if it, if it had reached its end and it just kept wrapping around and writing over itself if, if you ever got to five packets that were outstanding at that level. And so occasionally that was happening and it was dropping packets. And then I, I was able to fix it in a second when I found it. So that's to say, it's not always your fault, but it is most of the time. <laughs> so when we do debugging, the scientific, there's a scientific method you could use, which is a classical approach that you've probably all learned about in grade school, right? You gather data through repeatable experiments, right? Which actually that can be harder than you think. What's, what's, what, what, sometimes what's really hard to debug is when you have a system that every time you run it, it gets a different answer for the same inputs. You, th there, you, what you have to do is try to see, can I get the system to the point where I can predict what's going to happen? Form a hypothesis that accounts for the relative data, for the relevant data. Design, an, I don't know, there seems to be some formatting issues here. Design a, um, um, this probably shouldn't have a, have a thing, and this should be here. Oh, wait, what am I doing? I think that will make it look a little better. Um, design an experiment to prove or disprove the hypothesis, and then do prove or disprove it, and then repeat it as needed, right? So you gather evidence, you come up with hypotheses, you test those hypotheses. Classical scientific method. So to put it in terms of debugging, stabilize the error. What do you think stabilize the error means? Like Make sure you know, sorry. Uh, make sure you know what um, cases the error comes up in. Like in the book, it had um, it had one that had hyphens, and so right. it had to like test several different things to figure out that the hyphen was what was causing the error. Right, right. So you want to find you right. You want to have some level of predictability, right? Because if it's just if you're at a, at a state where it's like I have no idea what I'm seeing then you have no way of moving forward. So you, right, you find some common element that you can, that, that, that seems to be stable across the tests. Locate the source of the error, the fault. How do we do that? Gather data that produces the defect. Analyze the data that's been gathered. Again, form a hypothesis, say, okay, this is the data we got. Let's look at it and see what's in common, let's see what's different, and let's see if we can come up with, you know, we say, well, when we see this, it happens. When we don't see this, it doesn't happen, right? And then from that hypothesis, see if you can come up with a way to prove or disprove it, right? Say, okay, well, if I'm only seeing this when I do this, and I'm not seeing it when I do that, let's do a bunch of experiments that test that theory and see if that, that, that I do have that predictability, right? So if you can come up with a way of, with a prediction that works, you've learned something. Then what you can then do is look for the code, look at the code and find out what would cause that sort of phenomena and, and and then test it, you know, you say, oh, I, I see this. Let's check to see for sure if, if what I'm seeing in this code is explained by the tests that I made. And if it is, you fix the code and test it. And a great thing to do when you have an error is to say, I, you know, I see what I did there. I wonder if I did the same thing somewhere else. Because oftentimes you make the same mistake more than once because especially if it was a misunderstanding that caused you to make that mistake. 
So stabilize the error. If the error occurred, doesn't, we already kind of talked about that, right? If it doesn't, if it's not predictable, if it's totally random, what are you going to do? Now, sometimes you can end up with fairly random errors, and there's an oftentimes an explanation for that, and that is, is in a language like C++, if, if you've got a random value in a variable, it's probably because it was never initialized, right? <laughs> and, and that's kind of random that, that, that's very hard to stabilize because you can't predict what's going to be in a memory location that hasn't had anything put into it. Find the minimum situation that causes the error and work to get the error to be repeatable, right? So the minimum situation is, is you know, you reduce it down to, you know, if I do any less than this, I don't get the error. If I do more than this, I still get the error, but this seems to be the cutoff. Um, okay, look at the out, for finding the error, look at the output in the code and hypothesize about possible causes, create test cases to test your hypothesis. You say, well, okay, my hypothesis predicts that if I do this, this will happen. Test that out. Refine and retest until you have verified your hypothesis. And again, the underlying goal is to really understand what's going on. Not even just finding the, the, the error, because if you just say, well, it's this line, you might really not understand the bigger picture. Use, you know, tips. Use all the data available in making your hypothesis. Refine test cases that produce the error, right? Make them more and more specific. Find out exactly what the cutoffs are. Exercise your code in your test unit test suite and reproduce the error several different ways. Now, exercising the code in your unit test suite, um, I can definitely tell you a story about this. So one time I was working on a system that, that basically what happened was, is we had a embedded device that we wanted to put a, use public private key encryption, which basically is a type of encryption that, 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 that creates these really long keys and it uses factorization of, of, of huge prime numbers to, um, to to, in the process of decrypting without going on in any detail. Well, we had this little tiny machine that hardly had any memory. And we wanted to, again, we wanted to do public, it only had 65K of RAM inside the entire device for everything. And we were using like 60K, so there was only like 4K left. So I got this open source software that did public key encryption, compiled it, and it took 100K. So just that one routine was bigger than our entire memory. And so we said, well, what are we gonna do now? Well, I said, I can rewrite it to be really efficient in C, and just in pure C. And so I spent a couple of weeks, and it was a lot of work, because, because oh, you're working with prime numbers and numbers in general that have three to 500 digits, right? So I had to be able to multiply, divide, add and subtract numbers in a small amount of memory, you know, code-wise, that were, that, that were these really large numbers. So I had to write the equivalent of what's called a big num routine, which allows you to have basically numbers that have unlimited precision. In my case, they didn't need to be unlimited, but they needed to be literally, you know, numbers that were a thousand digits long. And so, I wrote the code to do multiplication, division, adding and subtraction on, long, on big numbers, which of course were big long arrays of bytes. And it worked. I was able to encrypt and decrypt things fairly quickly in only 4K of RAM for the program. The program size was only 4K. It was amazing. I mean, I, uh, I wonder if I still have that code somewhere. It was some of the most amazing code I've ever written. I thought, yes, it works. I said, but you know, I better make sure it works. And so what I did, which eventually killed, actually 
was the end of my laptop because it couldn't handle it, it heated up too much. But what I did was I wrote a program that encrypted and decrypted with random keys over and over and over again. And public key encryption takes a lot of horsepower because again, you have to factor these large numbers to find these primes. And I ran it for two weeks solid, factoring and you know decrypting and encrypting. And after two weeks, I got an error. Two weeks before I got an error. And I looked at it and it turned out that I had, I was, I was not setting a bit when I was doing some, some subtraction. There was a carry bit fault at one point in one particular case that I rarely ever hit. And it took me two weeks of, of, of my computer running at a, at a, at a full blast for, to find that error. <laughs> but it was good I found it because we were able to then put it in this product. Um, now, one of the things we sort of do is, is something we kind of call um, triangulation, right? Triangulation is this, no, is this concept where you figure out where something's at by looking at it from different directions, right? So if here we have this image of a program and there's a defect in there and we don't know where it's at. And the test, in a sense, provides a perspective, a slice through the program where it could be is one way to think about it. So we do the first test and we get a defect. We do another test and it doesn't hit the defect, right? We do a third test and we hit the defect, right? We do a subsequent test. And so we find tests that hit the defect. And that's sort of this notion of triangulization. Um, so what are some tips? Generate more data to generate more hypothesis, right? If, if, a, if, if you only do one or two tests, you know, or three or four, you may not have enough data to really understand it. You need to perhaps do more tests. Use the results of negative tests. A negative test is something that didn't find an error, and you can use that to rule in or rule out certain aspects. You might want to talk to other people, brainstorm for hypothesis. You know, um, oftentimes, in fact, I can't tell you the number of times that students have come in and they've been working and working and working and working on something and they're stuck and they, and it's not working and they come in and they talk to me and I say, okay, you know, rather than hopefully being a good teacher, rather than just find the problem for them, I, I ask a few questions and we talk about it for a while and I say, please explain to me what you think is going on. And as they're explaining to it, all of a sudden their eyes get wide and they say, oh, I think I know what it is now, right? So just talking to other people can be huge. Sometimes it's good to keep track of things that worked in the past and make a list of them and try those sort of things in the future. And again, you can narrow the suspicious region of code. Now, this is one of the reasons, by the way, to build your code a little bit of, at a time and test it, because then you have less code to be suspicious when you encounter an error. This is usually what I do. I don't write, you know, 300 lines and then say, does it work? Um, I always be suspicious of areas where there was defects before because defects mean the code had a fundamental problem and you, when you fixed it, you may not have fixed it right, right? Um, Check code that's changed recently, right? If you hadn't had a bug and then you did, it's a good chance it's in code that was recently changed. Um, expand the suspicious region of the code. Integrate into, in, incrementally. This last thing is what I was talking about, is that if you do little pieces at a time, you have less code to worry about when you're looking for the, for the bug. Um, check for common defects, right? Over time, you learn these are the sorts of things, problems that occur, right? Somebody didn't initialize a variable. Um, somebody had the wrong range. 
on a on a loop right somebody didn't make the array as big as it needed to be and you went off the end right there's a whole list of things that are common types of errors and oftentimes these are language specific right different languages like it, you can't run off the edge of a python array but you can a c plus plus array take a break sometimes you have to take a break in fact um a lot of times the hardest problems i've ever solved has been when I'm out for a bike ride or for a walk in the woods, or um, I wake up at five in the morning and my brain actually works better and it's like, aha. <laughs> now, there is something called brute force debugging, sort of a last resort thing if everything else fails. Throw away the section of code and redesign or recode it from scratch. Definitely have done this before. Um, and, you know, if you've got a pesky piece of code that you can't get to work, again, I was one time writing a wireless driver and I had this big routine and it grew bigger and bigger and it was up to about, you know, probably a couple hundred lines of code, which is a, a lot of code when you're inside of an, an in, in a driver that's responding to, to system interrupts and has to run really fast anyway and I had errors in it and finally I just said I'm starting from scratch I rewrote it and it was so nice and I never had an error again in that code um, and um, <laughs> in fact funny thing about that code is is um, I, I wrote this product and I didn't even know that it got released and it did. And for years later, in fact, one time, like 10 years later, I, got a, I, get, a, I get a call from somebody out of the blue for, in Africa and they're like, yeah, we're using your driver and we need to know how to fix this problem. And I'm like, I'm sorry, <laughs> you know, I, I can't help you. You know, that company doesn't even exist anymore. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I haven't looked at that code for 10 years. <laughs> Throw away the whole program, compile the code with full debugging. This is actually a nice trick, right? Oftentimes you say, I don't want to see those pesky warnings. Well, a warning is there for a reason. And you can, if you, and you can set the debug information level to give you more or less information about things that could be problematic. You know, for example, for if you put a larger, a large, like a, a two byte integer, I'm sorry, a four byte integer into a two byte integer, there's data truncation. That will usually give you a warning if you have the warnings turned up high enough. Um, because a lot of times errors, a lot of times errors like that, let's say you're putting a four bit number, I mean, a four byte number into a two byte number in, in C++, that's called, an int is four bytes and a short is two bytes. That will give you a warning. Now let's say you write a program and you don't see that warning because you had it turned off and everything works and you put it out in the field and it works just fine. It might even work fine for years. And then, you know, over time, you know, maybe it's this number is a number of of data items in a data structure and it's fine because you have less than you know, 32,000 things in that list. Well, somebody's using it and they go over that and boom, everything blows up in their face. Um, so put, turn on the pickiest warning level. So let me, let me see what else is here because we're kind of almost out of time. So, um, <laughs> so I guess just to sort of wrap it up here, you know, fixing the defect, rule number one is understand what you're fixing, right? Don't guess, make sure you can explain what happened. 
So, and I understand the overall program, not just the problem, because if you're just looking at an isolated piece of code, you may not know how that changes, affects everything else. Confirm the di defect diagnosis through testing, relax, save the original source code, which isn't gonna be a problem if you're using get, fix the problem, not the symptom, change the code only for good reasons. So that's sort of just, lessons to learn as you do um, as you do debugging. Um, actually, I guess there was one more slide here. Um, yeah, make one change at a time. Anytime you do a, disc, diff, a defect, find, look for other, uh, the same defect, because you might've made that mistake more than once and add a unit test that exposes the defect. In fact, sometimes in some complex software, you, you actually have the ability of turning things on and off, turning on levels of tests that go on. And so if you get a bug, you turn the level up and try to get more thing, more conditions logged, and then you can look through that log and try to find an error. All right, so, we're done for today. Um, I just want to really quickly make sure I know what we're doing on Monday. Um, Monday is our last, is that right? We don't have class next Wednesday, is that right? Yeah, so Monday we're talking about personal character. Nothing's due, there will be a quiz. Um, now, the November 30th after break is when we're gonna have some demonstrations. So everybody's gonna do a demo of what they've had so far and we're gonna talk about it. The art people will be there, um, Caroline, Caroline and, um, and Jody. And um, that's what we'll do. So enjoy your weekend. I'll see you on Monday. Thank you, bye. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Yep. See you later. <laughs>